Well, this is such a fun moment, hitting all-time highs across across the uh, the spectrum. Um, it's just been a fascinating couple of weeks at Constellation and Lattice. Like this uh, this engine of an ecosystem that we're building is nothing short of amazing, and it just continues to fuel my inspiration and. Um, in so many ways. And it's fun to see everybody show up and get excited and uh, learn something new, participate. How do you get involved? But for all the, those that, that have never come to the Hypergraph Hour, um, the Hypergraph Hour, uh, as I kind of do this little brief intro, uh, is something that we started several months ago to introduce um, our roadmaps that we established at the company, introduce partners that uh, that we've we've kind of built over time that we're excited to announce or build something with. Uh, we've introduced advisors. Last week, we even brought in uh, a good friend of ours. Uh, it's a managing partner at uh, a venture capital firm and providing insights on where markets are heading, uh, how you evaluate new opportunities. Um, and then, you know, we're going to dial it back a little bit today and uh, why it is going to um, talk about state channels and L0, uh, which has been on everybody's mind. And there's been a lot of materials out there. And uh, I think this is the most, this is probably one of the most exciting things that, that we've done as, as a company. Um, and this is really kind of why it's Opus in many ways. Uh, and in some ways he's made, he's simplified a lot of what's going on in his mind into L0 for everybody. Um, so I don't really need to introduce Wyatt, but today is going to be a technical hypergraph hour and uh, really set the stage for the for the next year, uh, as well as set the stage for the next several months with new announcements and partnerships. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Wyatt Meltman flock Thank you so much for that wonderful intro, um, Ben. That was... Uh too kind. Um, but no, it was also uh, very much the truth. We are going to have a little technical deep dive today, uh, as well as with a live demo of, you know, the first look at uh, a state channel, uh, most notably our L1 um, and our L0, and sort of how these things work. Um, but I'm also going to uh, touch on a couple of different topics that other folks have asked about too. So um, I'm going to start with those topics first. And then I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> All right, cool. So um, this is the uh, hypergraph hour for uh, today. <laughs> anyway, so the three main topics that we're going to be talking about today are um, the L0, the L1, and uh, some topics on token economics that individuals have asked. So I'm going to jump into the token economics, uh, token economics questions first, um, and then uh, into the L0 and 1. Uh, I'll probably take a pause after the token economics just to answer some questions too. So we'll do that. So um, what does it really mean to to be a currency? And I, I like to start with this slide a lot um, because what it, what, it, what it is is just to be a transaction uh, or some sort of medium that connects goods and services in an economy. Um, and that's exactly what we have achieved here um, with the L0 and, and DAG as well. But uh, there are some key features that differentiate us from, uh, you know, both our competition and just you know the traditional finance of today. Um, so one of these is normalized access. So uh, in addition, you know, similarly to uh, you know proof of stake networks and in DPoS, um, you know, access to sort of network resources can be connected to the stake inside of someone's address. And so this can be factored into any kind of calculation, whether it comes from you know validated rewards to bandwidth. Um, this really just you know boils down to the decision of uh, you know, the team that is hosting the state channel and something that is tied to your e uh, economics. So um, this is really the, uh, the main lever that we can, we can tie as well as uh, just hosting nodes in order to uh, make sure that we have access to the network. Um, and I took this from our most recent uh, like paper that we released uh, from the token economics. And this is a representation of the uh, stake versus bandwidth um, from, yeah. There And so there's lots of different ways that we can model this and we can sort of change that graph um, depending on um, how you would like to define 
uh, a currency associated to, you know, your state channel. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, a bit of a shift in terms of what does it mean to actually be, um, you know, an L0 token? And what does that mean from an economic perspective? Um, well, that gives us this new class of data type called an emission. So uh, this concept of an emission that has been floated around, um, at least inside of our internal working groups, uh, and at least indefinitely in, um, in our technical working groups, is really meant to be some kind of uh, symmetric dual to a transaction. And what this does is it rebalances DAG amounts across different potential you know, dimensions one could think of um, within the L0 layer. And so emission is basically a way in which we can make a transaction with a liquidity pool, uh, which is basically a representation of, you know, some type of financial value, um, but also uh, network resources that can be tapped, uh, tapped upon. Uh, that is the interface between someone's state channel or base layer and, uh, you know, all other state channels uh, and thus base layers. And that, and that happens on the L0. So, um, you know, and, and this uh, from the concept of um, uh, like a cross chain perspective, uh, this is really meant to be sort of like an L a ERC-20 like interface that can solve uh, a lot of problems with cross chain liquidity out of the box uh, and basically give individuals the opportunity to create cross chain tokens and applications, um, you know, with a verified and reusable interface. And so there's lots of different reward types um, that can come up uh, or that basically can make sense for the developer of some, uh, a base layer token or a base layer, uh, or sorry, a state channel token. So these are really interchangeable. Um, you know, some of these lend themselves directly to the traditional finance world. Some of these things can be, uh, you know, directly just connected, um, you know, as, uh, you know, just some sort of metric for performing, uh, you know, voting or, you know, interacting with an application that's hosted by one of these L1s. Uh, and there's a lot of different, um, you know, ways we can mix and match. And there are some examples that I've shared um, also on GitHub. So um, without jumping uh, too deep into that, um, these came directly from some of the questions that, that were shared um, from the community. And I just wanted to take a pause uh, to see if maybe anybody has any question um, questions right now on the token economics um, before I dive into to the L0 stuff. Well, why right. one, one question that came up was, uh, could you talk us through starting balances and reward manifold figures in the tokenomics paper? Yeah, absolutely. So when you can essentially think about an address um, uh, as being like your interface into the world of, you know, all base layer tokens. Um, and essentially your, your DAG address has the ability to shift value from base layer to base layer. Uh, and essentially is sort of like an index for all of your different cryptos. Um, and it allows you to interact uh, or sort of mix and match them and sort of interact with, um, you know, basically all of your different bags uh, using these different bridge nodes um, and something that can be directly managed on the client side, um, just like, uh, like a wallet. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. No, Keep rolling. On here. Pleasure. Um, so I have this amazing slide. Shout out to, uh, to Headroom who um, made this uh, amazing infographic about Node 2.0 um, because I think this is a great, uh, you know, step into um, the little walkthrough I wanted to show about, uh, you know, getting consensus to operate on top of streams. And so, um, you know, we can share this uh, in the future as well. I don't know if it's worth trying to, trying to zoom in per se, Um well, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll share this at a later time, um, but it's a great infographic and maybe I'll, I'll stop back uh, there on the way out. So uh, I just wanted to uh, touch back on uh, why, why uh, hypergraph and this kind of concept of like a, a currency. Um, and so the idea here is that by creating these L0 tokens, like I was just saying, actually to that last question, um, you essentially uh, are, you know, shifting value and, and thus sort of like an account balance between different like microservice providers. So thinking about this as though it's like, uh, you know, maybe you've topped up some kind of like an account balance on like a cell phone or something. Um, this is sort of a way in which you can shift that value back and forth between these different accounts um, and, and sort of treat those as their own independent networks, um, which solves the scaling problem pretty, pretty natively. So um, basically, uh, you know, what's this concept of an L1 that I've been talking about uh, and that we talk about extensively inside of the token economics paper? 
So the L1 uh, is basically a sort of standardization of what we just we think of as like a base layer, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and you know whatever what other kind of you know token is running its own live network, uh, as opposed to like an ERC20 or something that's like a you know L2 token. Um, and so that's sort of uh, where that comes from. And so at least from the DAG perspective, um, what we are able to do, uh, which sort of enables, that sort of it does enable the L0 layer um, is to organize this data topologically such that it gives us a sort of smooth time. Uh, and that basically allows us to reason about the state of our network uh, and, and different data types that um, are, as we sort of showed before, uh, can be normalized um, and so this normalization occurs using Shannon entropy um, and sort of use and sorry uh, and user defined data types such that we can understand disorder in how nodes perform uh, and, and make decisions based upon um, some sort of self awareness of the rel the recent previous state of the network. Um, and so yeah, that's sort of the the TLDR there. And so I'm going to show you guys actually something really cool, which is um, you know right hot off the press. Um, basically an implementation of our L1, the DAG L1, operating directly on top of streams, uh, which is pretty dope because that, that basically means that um, as opposed to like before with a you know, linear blockchain, basically like you know, taking all these transactions, buffering them inside of a mempool, um, we can just stream them uh, with only a small you know, margin of you know, buffering or marshalling that needs to happen um, in order for us to reorganize or sort or join them into the correct, you know, intermediate form um, and just continue that down into a final de uh, destination. So this completely changes the game in terms of how do we actually perform consensus um, from being some kind of really big esoteric special thing to really just being a, you know, like a uniform API call, uh, series of API calls. So that's, that's, that's fundamentally it now. Uh, and that's dope and I can't wait to show you. And so uh, I have a little bit more on the L0. Uh, and, and, and so one really important thing is that L0 tokens are technically still DAG. So all tokens that register themselves with the L0 uh, it define a liquidity pool. And that liquidity pool is a way of handling funds. Uh, and also like, I should not say funds, but tokens because tokens are not necessarily just funds, but they are the ability to perform action across different base layers. So like they, they hold access to different tokens for performing the you know, utility of each different base layer. And so this is basically like the you know, tank in the car, if you will, that holds the fuel um, in order to get access to the different network resources, depending on how you design your state channel, uh, whether or not you've, you know, are hosting nodes or you're holding onto a large amount of DAG in order to, uh, or sorry, um, Rather, you're uh, hosting nodes in order to pay for your throughput or you're holding a lot of DAG in order to uh, get into a higher tier or something like that, depending on you know, what those, those rules are. So DAG is really important because it provides a unit of value that is universal and normalizable across all different uh, ledgers. So, uh, and the units are bits uh, per second, although it's, it's really not necessarily second, but some sort of like ordered, you know, partial ordered uh, set you know, topology, but it's essentially just like bits per second where things can happen sort of at the same time. Uh, we just have to top a lot of people or order them in order to understand you know, what's going on. So uh, same thing. Anyway, um, so that's pretty cool because because DAG is, is actually literally like a Bitcoin because it's made out of bits per second. So I, I think that's cool personally. I, I, I always get a kick out of that. Anyway, um, but yeah, without further ado, um, I'm going to show you um, a little bit not a little bit, but I'm going to show you a little demo uh, of consensus operating on a stream. And so this is our L1. And what I'm basically going to do is um, run this thing and sort of show you what's going on. So basically what we do here is we set up uh, like a series of nodes. And so this is just like a, a unit test, something that like tests out the stuff that um, we've built uh, locally when we're making like changes and stuff that it's a little bit like something you do before you actually go through the headache of deploying like a full cluster. Um, and what we did is we set up a, a stream. And so what this stream does is it pipes transactions into a cell. And so this cell right here is the main unit uh, and sort of you know interface and connector point 
for your server or your application to talk with somebody else over HTTP. So this is like a monadic uh, execution contact or not. This is a uh, monad that contains the results uh, of some type of API call or, or process. Um, and it's executed by uh, some type of execution context. And so in more familiar terms for anybody who has used like JavaScript or like React, um, this is basically like a future. And so what's really cool about these futures is that you can chain these things together in their own you know, DAG or sort of graph and then get uh, an understanding of the state of you know, many different protocols, different servers, like what have you and who name it, um, that, that you want. And so the real magic here is that by implementing um, you know, a cell interface for you know, an existing L1, uh, and then also just the you know hosting an L0 cell, similar to how I'll show you down here, um, you can basically connect uh, like Bitcoin to DAG, which is pretty tight. Uh, it's been more than tight, but you know. Anyway, so uh, the most important thing here is you have to take some type of data type, uh, you know, some kind of, I guess if you're just making a, a simple get request, or not like a get or a, maybe a post request would be a better example. Um, you know, you have some kind of a body that you're trying to send it's pretty much the same shit right here. And we call it an edge, uh, similar to like an edge bundle uh, in math. And that basically just means it's like a wrap up of a bunch of different like data points that have their own topological coordinates. Um, and that sort of like forms and stitches together kind of like a quilt, um, or I think, I think that's what we call an atlas um, with like a manifold. But basically the most important thing here is that what really defines the actual like operation of your cell um, is, are these two things called an algebra and a co-algebra. And so by defining these, it basically defines how your consensus works um, for your application. So this is kind of be like how you define um, your ERC-20 token, um, but instead by building your own state channel. And so what's really cool is that uh, an algebra is a teardown structure, kind of like a um, catamorphism, like a fold, and a co-algebra is a build-up morphism, like an anamorphism, like a, uh, an unfold. And so when you put these two things together, you get something called a hylomorphism. And when you put them together in reverse, you get something called a metamorphism. Um, and so I could, I could ramble on a little bit more about that later. I don't know if now is necessarily the time uh, that sort of gets into the L0 stuff. But um, yeah, I, I can basically just sort of keep it at a high level to say that what you do is you're essentially parameterizing um, some type of a functorial operator, which basically means you're creating some type of a typed recursion. Um, and what's really important about that is that when we are dealing with purely recursive structures, we can peer in and understand the structure of you know, their recursion and understand what happened, especially in a stateful system. It gives us some sort of a context from which we can understand like what was the stateful transition uh, within the system. And so uh, in this case, we use hylomorphism. This is why we like called uh, in the original, why I called the, in the original paper, um, you know, the protocol hylo chain or like what that basically meant at that time uh, is basically the creation of these different like gather apply scatters or holomorphisms um, that are, you know, typed. Uh, and, and the magic here is that the type basically allows us to introspect and understand like what happened about our program. Um, this gets into stuff called like co colored operads and, you know, magic, but it's not time for now, not for now. We will get there someday. Um, and then basically I just want to show you a quick uh, example here for our algebra. This is essentially just tearing down the results of a series of API calls. Um, and all the magic in the L1 just happens in the co-cell here, uh, where we're basically just creating the different stages of creating like a sort of like a triangle of API calls. So we have a start um, node, we have two uh, facilitator nodes. Uh, the starter is like the, the owner um, and the two facilitators. The facilitators create an edge between themselves, return the result back to um, the start node that creates a, a triangle, which is actually a block made out of edges. And that corresponds to the structure that I was showing inside of the generative economics paper uh, in a video, I think they came out a little bit before. And I was talking about the space that our data structures make, uh, what that means from like a four dimensional, you know, IE creating, you know, time kind of space. So that's the L1, um, it's really dope. And you, you can basically walk through these different processes of that triangulation right here. Um, and so that's, this is all on, on GitHub and, and Tessellation, I can point you guys to it. Um, it's phenomenal. This is uh, operating on streams now. And basically what happens is if we have errors, we just re queue information back onto there. Um, and we can sort of, you know, basically treat, um, you know, data processing through this, you know, type of a, a blockchain or this type of a protocol, HTTP, literally is like a streamed, uh, you know, operation or stream join, um, which is, I mean, that was the, the goal we set out to do. And this is, um, it's pretty game changing because, you know, this is, 
you know, the, the days of, you know, spending 30 bucks and waiting a few minutes for a transaction to clear are like over, man. And this is it. <laughs> So this is kind of a big debut and I can, I don't want to get super deep on the L zero, but um, you know, it's very similar as well, just uh, running, uh, you know, over a stream. Um, and so basically there's, you know, more that we're going to connect this to here, which is like how we connect, uh, you know, calculate majorities, uh, you know, of like the of the snapshot of a certain set of, of blocks. Um, but that's really just connecting that back in the, the consolation repo. And so um, I'll share some more. We'll, we're going to share like a ton more. Um, with each individual person, like who worked on, you know, stuff is going to share components and things about it in a more detailed walkthrough later. But um, you can already take a look at this stuff on GitHub because uh, it because it's running and it works and it's pretty phenomenal to see, you know, at least two new two types of consensus implemented now operating on streams. Uh, but they also have all those, you know, bells and whistles that we just showed. So um, I'm gonna take a pause because there's, you know so much that we can show, but I'd rather just answer pointing questions. Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to show. And um, yeah. Hey, hey, why maybe I'll um, help kind of uh, put it in, in perspective for a lot of people. Um, maybe you could describe why our token standard is so revolutionary compared to like, an EOS standard or a Tron standard or even an ERC-20. <clears throat> and maybe a lot of people will understand that on the call, but maybe you could put it in comparison to other ecosystems. Yeah, 100%. So there are not really, uh, there really isn't a solution to cross-chain liquidity that has been provided that at least I'm aware of across the board that kind of solves the problem of dynamically allocating, you know, values or like units of value across different lenders um, with different types of, you know, convert, I guess you could say different types of consensus logic. Um, and so what this does is it basically allows for us, you know, developers to have a out of the box solution for solving the problem that like Polkadot or is, is trying to do, you know, trying to solve cross chain liquidity. So, um, you know, basically this, this greatly simplifies, uh, you know, what you need to do in order to actually launch one of these things and get your application active and used um, and, and doing stuff. Thanks, Wyatt. And ha maybe you could, you know, cross-chain liquidity is a huge topic for a lot of people because now every ecosystem that we're talking to is about exchanging value. Uh, right. Maybe you can talk a little bit through your approach to like how you're solving cross-chain liquidity. Yeah, 100%. So as I was mentioning before, a core, a core value or not a core value, but a core kind of concept here is that um, what the L0 standard does is it normalizes values across different ledgers. What, is, what does that mean to normalize a value across a ledger? So what, what is a value that a ledger has? What's a ledger? Okay, It's, a, it's an account balance and, a, and some kind of a number, right? But these things can be repurposed to do complex operations such as verify and validate smart contracts uh, and you know, do what you know, the L0 does um, by changing those values from um, uh, you know, just an address to a number to an address and some type of a complex like data type. And so what a complex data type is, is some type of a unit of data that you can think of kind of like a diamond or some kind of a ruby or some kind of a data point that holds a value. Like, I don't think a lot of people know this, but like there's trillions of dollars spent every single day. And I like, I operated on this data and the space in this world of all of your individual user data. People buy this stuff, write algorithms on it and make tons of money um, in order to send you ads and do things like that. And so these, these data points have tons of, of value. Um, and this basically, this standard, what it does is it takes these data points um, and finds a way to represent them as just you know, shapes or objects um, that can be stacked on top of one another uh, and sort of form like a structure. That's basically it. And so that's how you solve that problem. And what it does is it allows you to say, oh, I have one Bitcoin, I wanna buy you know, X amount of DAG um, and basically just, you know, natively swap that, that value um, using a bridge uh, node. So why would it be fair to say that what we're essentially solving between DAG and Lattice Exchange is a 
is that we really don't care what ecosystem you build a solution. You want to build a smart contract solution with Ethereum, but really what Lattice is doing is kind of in, inviting liquidity to, to operate within our network and all activity and trading activity and exchanging, whether it's simple data structures or complex data structures to occur on Lattice that's under that's being underwritten by Constellation. Yeah. Those are more. I, no, I, no, I was just going to say if you wanted, <laughs> if you wanted to add more to your vision on creating um, a, a broader data marketplace, I think a lot of people hear data marketplace and they think maybe Ocean Protocol or um, they think of a centralized oh, yeah. place. And really, your vision of underwriting uh, data becomes kind of like an index to uh, right. the Nasdaq or. Yeah, no, absolutely. I guess I, I'd love to jump there. So um, TLDR is that uh, right now, um, you know, our traditional financial system in a lot of ways, uh, and most of these companies are propping themselves up on the collection of user data and their ability to take products to market. So essentially, you have this kind of like pairing between, you know, Fortune 500 companies and this sort of dark data market that, you know, sort of underpins the whole situation there. Um, but what's kind of interesting, what we've seen over the last two years, and by the way, that, that's been happening for decades. We've seen over the last, you know, several years is that, you know, the, the crypto space has, has, you know, blown up and actually created the first, you know, decentralized like ecosystem and environment that um, has really kind of, you know, not has, has, you know, gone leaps and bounds um, and, and sort of changed the face of like, you know, from the perspective of like Napster or something. Um, really gone and shown that like decentralization is is the future. And so um, what's what's really happening here is that when we actually, you know, think about decentralization and, and being a part of just a person who has an address or a person who has a node, um, is your sharing access to your, you know, data with somebody else um, and, you know, participating in some type of a process to verify and validate that that state and that data. Um, and this is really the holy grail for that entire industry, uh, you know, the, the data marketplaces and the people who want to get access to your stuff through Facebook because they want to sell you stuff or, you know, buy an election. Um, and, and so, like, what we can actually do is create decentralized alternatives that are backed in these data structures that allow for uh, this information to be, you know, you know, transacted and interacted upon within our economy um, and also connect it to us as data producers and, and sort of connect us inside of the ecosystem and the, you know, capitalist food chain of, like, how this whole kind of thing happens. And so the TLDR here is that um, by what blockchain technology like really was, uh, you know, promising to do was the ability to underwrite the entire world with some kind of a understanding or guarantee or at least something on top of the physical state of reality. Um, but by actually, you know, what we found was that consensus processes themselves weren't able to scale to, you know, what our IoT world um, can scale to. Uh, what it needs to in order to provide that kind of a reality um, from just like a networking perspective. Uh, so all of this stuff, what it really amounts to is basically the ability to tokenize the data pipelines that operate all of this sort of interconnected world that's being built around us. Um, and so it allows for us to monetize our just very beingness, uh, whether, you know, whether you want to have like a website or just create your own NFT or something like this is a way to interact uh, with the economy on, you know, your own terms and, you know, in order to sort of, you know, basically create an index, if you will, that already exists uh, for the greater economy itself of the data marketplace uh, and these, these data marketplace industries, um, which, you know, will have a net utility benefit for all the players involved. It's just the growth of the economy to understand that information just by being a commodity itself and how it's being sold in these secondary markets kind of negates the whole theory of arbitrage, which is that having extra information about other people can't give you an advantage in the market. Like these algorithms are fundamentally like just show that like, you know, these original systems of like, you know, like welfare economics aren't really possible when somebody has an added advantage, you know, on that. And so this sort of fixes that, but also creates new opportunities for wealth and stabilization of people's like day-to-day -day lives. That's not maintained by a small centralized bank or something like that. So I think it's pretty tight. Um, and uh, one thing that I think is really cool is that like a lot of folks, when they see this shit and they see what I just showed y'all about the, you know, the streams, 
is that people, you know, build data pipelines, processing shit, you know, every day, like, you know, on with using these in, bits of information to help marketing campaigns and do this, that, and the other, and all this stuff. Like a lot of these different existing data pipelines out there could just be tokenized with like the flip of a switch with this. And so what this does is it basically, you know, is a backdoor to this existing like whole world and it brings it online and into a brand new marketplace um, that, you know, is, I, I don't really need to pitch economics to you to do it, but yeah, so that's the whole thing. And that's kind of how we, we do that. So get ready, datapreneurs. Yeah, I, I think one of the big things that you set out to kind of uh, demystify is our distorted reality in the digital frontier that we have. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it, it just it, totally. I mean, and the the crazy thing about this stuff and what crypto is in this world and this this tech is that like, because it's the opportunity to actually create our own market and our own our own world um, that directly reflects you know our our ethos and our values and. Here we are. Um, and also like you can, if you guys have a website out there or something, just tokenizing stuff, you know, and becoming a part of, you know, hosting servers and things like it's a ticket to freedom, man. Well, I think one of the interesting things when I met you years ago is that you, you had, you talked to me about all the use cases that everybody was defining by blockchain and you're like, it'll never happen with existing protocols. And this is how we do it. And now here we are. Yeah, man. Thank you. And that, that was what I just showed you, man. I was like, just getting that shit to work on a stream. Like, you know, we, we've got a lot of stuff we're still working on and, you know, keeping rolling out for our node 2.0. But like that right there was, I mean, that's it, man. I mean, like we can, that's working proof. And um, yeah, it's only up from here. So it's been a crazy few years and. Man, talk about the, yeah. So yeah, man, it's been a great day. It's been a great, uh, it's a great, great couple of weeks. I'm really excited. I got to show that with you guys. I got some more coming. I think maybe in a few weeks, I'm going to do another one of these guys. Um, show a little bit more uh, about the protocol, something called the Arrow, which is how we connect the L1 and the L0 together. Um, and then a little bit about what it's going to look like for users to just build their own state channels. So that's going to be the focus probably in May. Um, so yeah, that's all I got everybody. So I'm happy to just take questions and thank you all. Thank you for your kind words, man. That was beautiful. You're a poet and a musician and a genius all in one, my friend. Uh, so, so beautiful. Um, full of shit too. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, any questions for, for Wyatt um, trying to help kind of navigate some of these things? I'm well, buddy, any, any yeah. other little nuggets you want to drop about, you know, some of the, uh, any other nuggets you want to drop about what you want to present in a couple of weeks and give people start to think <laughs> about um, uh, what you're going to talk about? Yeah, I'll drop some nuggets. Um, so essentially the key is to how one builds a state channel or how you build your own like secure pipeline um, or like secure API is how do you chain together these different cells? Uh, so you can sort of think about that cell I was talking about earlier. It's like, a, like an actual physical like cell, like a, like a biological cell. Um, and when we get to, you know, next week, maybe even a higher dimensional kind of weird like sponge-like surface. Um, so it actually comes from the comp concept of a cell complex. And what that means is basically sort of how we, you know, you know, do math in a space where we're dealing with like a crystal lattice um, or some kind of higher dimensional surface um, or some kind of like quantum probability distribution and a bunch of high dimensions and shit. Um, and so like, yeah, basically like um, the TLDR here is that what you can do is form something called a category in or, uh, and what you do is you make a category that has certain, you know, properties, you know, of it that allow you to know about the contents of it. <laughs> so I don't know how that makes sense. It's, it's really weird. So basically like you create this, this concept of a category that works for cells. Right. And, and what a category does is it creates something called an arrow um, such that, uh, an arrow connects uh, or, you know, operates or changes 
the objects of, of the category into other objects of the category. So a cell into a cell. And so what we do is we can take user-defined functions uh, like an ERC-20 tokens functions in order to, you know, uh, or rather the functions that it defines in order to perform the utility that like makes it like special for whatever the hell it is. And what you do is you write those functions and you put them into this con this thing called an arrow. And so an arrow is just, a, it's like a class, it's an object really, um, that is full of these functions. And these functions are just like the external methods to a smart contract um, that are available from like the Web3 API. So for anyone who's ever used like Web3 or, you know, you've hit a smart contract via like, you know, the command line, um, you know, you hit it and it gives you that JSON object of, you know, all the different endpoints and yada, yada. Um, this is the same shablam. Uh, and it basically just shows how you can, you know, make an API call to it, how you can stream to and from it. Um, and, and also, um, you know, interact with the liquidity pool. So that's really the main kit and caboodle. And that's what it's going to be like for you to create your own um, token and your own base layer protocol uh, in the next coming months uh, as we release stuff. So um, it's going to be a little bit more uh, self-contained to like a walkthrough. And we will also have a ton more walkthroughs uh, on what I just showed you. Um, just a ton more uh, developer docs, walkthroughs, everything over the next couple of months, um, really just leading up to the Node 2.0. And then that's going to be a real huge um, milestone where we'll start, you know, getting everybody excited and pumped and, uh, you know, doing so doing a lot of community governance uh, decisions and where we want to go with launching our state channels. So it's a roadmap for the next quarter, I'd say. Thanks, Wyatt. And um, thank you, community, for, for chiming in and hitting 100. And I think we hit 170 people that joined. So. That's wow. pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty awesome to see. Um, I can't tell you how exciting this makes us all in, in the background and uh, all the conversations and, and building that's been going on and the team that we've assembled around us has just been nothing short of amazing. And so next week's going to be a fun one too. And then we'll bring it back to Wyatt so that he can kind of talk through uh, the applications of some of the things we discussed next week. So I think that concludes this hypergraph hour this week. And I can't tell you how awesome that was, man. Heck, I learned a few things. So really cool stuff. Great job. Um, so that's pretty much all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a, Thanks, Wyatt. Have a, have a great rest of your week.